Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Harold Coe, my former professor from law school. And I think as we look at his bio, and I won't read the whole thing because it's on the uh, handout that you probably got coming in, but um, you know, it's extraordinary. This is a guy who um, worked for both Republicans and Democrats um, in the legal advisor's office as a, a, an attorney in the Reagan administration, and then as the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights uh, in the Clinton administration. Um, and then uh, was the legal advisor in the first term of the Obama administration. He's somebody who's moved between public and private law practice um, and has been a tenure professor and then dean at Yale Law School, um, a, a Marshall Scholar at Oxford and a Supreme Court clerk. Um, and is featured um, in you know, that famous photo that went viral of Hillary Clinton tweeting and he's in the background on the aircraft carrier. So, <laughs> I think, you know, we look at your bio and we think, you know, we want to be you when we grow up. You know, I know I certainly do, and I'm already grown up. So, um, ha you know. Trying with anyone who's under the age of 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the first question is, you know, sort of, how did you do it? How did you know that you wanted to get involved in public affairs and national security and international law? Um, how did you go about designing a career and you know, moving back and forth seamlessly, it seems, between the academy and public service. Um, was it part of your game plan to start with, or, or was it just uh, an accident? And I think for many students who are considering careers in international affairs, you know, we, we all wonder, how, how did you do it? Well, when I was in sixth grade, I wrote down the whole plan, and I followed it. <laughs> no, no, what actually happened, um, and it was so random, ludicrously random. Um, so my father uh, and mother came from Korea, and my dad was an official in the uh, first democratic government of Korea. And that government was overthrown by a military coup, and he was essentially exiled. And he encouraged me to, he was a diplomat, an international lawyer, a professor, and he encouraged me to study physics. Um, and I think part of it was, you know, we were new in America, and he thought that um, if you knew physics, you didn't have to know English so well. And I think he also um, thought it was less political and less uh, chance of getting in trouble. Um, so I majored in physics for my freshman and sophomore year of uh, college. But the problem was I, I wasn't very good at physics. I was terrible at <laughs> And this became increasingly clear to me over time. Um, and then one day I was walking to a lab and a blonde haired friend of mine was coming the other way and he said, I'm going to a Japanese politics class. And I said, gee, why don't I do that? So I went with him and it just felt very natural. So I switched uh, my major. <coughs> and then my junior year, I was in a class and someone said, oh, so-and-so is kind of a, an in and outer. And I said, what's an in and outer? And they said, someone who's a professor, but who also serves in the government. And I raised my hand and I said, why is that a good thing? And they said, well, in America, you have tenure for a professor, so you can take leave of absence and work in the government and then go back to being a professor. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. So I decided to write a paper about this, and I interviewed a bunch of professors at Harvard, which is where I was an undergraduate, and they included um, uh, Edwin Reichauer, who was ambassador, and um, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, I tried to get in to see Henry Kissinger, he refused to see me. <laughs> I saw John Kenneth Galbraith, who was an ambassador to India. And I became convinced that this was extremely exciting. Um, then I went to graduate school for a couple of years, then I went to law school, and in law school, I took an international law class, and it was so bad and depressing, I decided I would give up this plan. Um, and I ended up uh, thinking I would go into private practice, but I got a clerkship on the DC circuit, and uh, I ended up clerking for a judge, Malcolm Wilkie, who was a very internationally minded, he was, had been general counsel of a uh, large uh, 
Fortune 500 corporation. And he assigned me to work on matters related to the restatement of foreign relations law, which was uh, in, in its third iteration. So I started to go to that. And then suddenly it occurred to me, you know, uh, maybe my dad was right. Um, international law, diplomacy, being a professor, uh, actually is something for which I was well suited. Um, and the first person I saw who I, I really idolized was Lou Henkett, who was a uh, co-teacher of Catherine's. And uh, I'll never forget, I saw him on a panel, and you know he was so knowledgeable and so smart. And I thought, gee, I could never know what he knows. And I, I could never know what these people know. So I thought, I'll go back to my original plan, which is not do that. But then um, several months later, an issue I had been working on at a law firm came up. And there was a panel, and I went to it. There were a bunch of old professors, and they were all talking about it. And I suddenly realized that they were sort of faking it. They didn't really know it as well as I did, because I had been working on it. And it suddenly dawned on me, if all I do is pay attention very closely for the next 30 years, I'll know a lot. <laughs> and so I started doing that. And then I started teaching at night and working during the day. And one day I noticed that my day was judging a moot court, teaching a class, working on an article, and then I had a day job. And I thought if I just got rid of the day job, um, everything would work out. And uh, then that sort of started me on my academic career. That's great. So then, um, by the time you made it to being legal advisor, um, talk to us a little bit about how you see how you saw the role of being legal advisor. John Bellinger talked a bit about this um, the other night, and um, you've written how the, the job of legal advisor is being a counselor, a conscience, uh, a spokesperson, and a defender. Can you talk a bit about how you, how you saw the role? So you're the general counsel of the State Department, and it's like being the general counsel of any large organization or government agency. It's just that you, know, you buy buildings, but they are in Kabul, and you help people get visas, and they have to be in Baghdad. Um, you're a counselor to the Secretary of State and um, the other high officials of the department, as well as to people in the White House. And you know, they have their views too. I mean, Hillary Clinton is a brilliant lawyer. So uh, the, what you're doing is you're, you're not just telling them what you think is the right thing. The question is, what would you like to do, and is it lawful or not? And a sort of unique role of the legal advisor is to um, have a relationship with the academic community and the learned society, the American Society of International Law. And very often the legal advisor is the spokesperson for the government when an international legal position is being discussed. And I, I felt there was a duty of mine to explain US legal positions, you know, whether controversial or not. Because at least people can take on or understand a position when it's been stated uh, publicly. And that's not easy. You have to get your positions cleared and approved by lots of people. There are thousands and thousands of lawyers who work on these issues in the government. In my office, there were 200 and something lawyers. Guess how many were in the Defense Department? Anybody know? We had 230. Any guesses? 3,000? 17,000. 17,000, then probably 11,000 to 15,000 in the Justice Department, Homeland Security, um, National Security Council, Treasury, um, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Director of National Intelligence. So a position to be cleared involves dozens and dozens of sign-offs. You, you know, some of the speeches I gave more than 100 people edited it. So if there's any lack of clarity, it's because of that. And it's funny because academics often say, you know, at the point where the opinion started getting interesting, that's where it stopped. And the answer is that that's where they stopped agreeing on what ought to be in it. And then everything else got dropped out. Um, and then finally, as Catherine said, you know, if the US government is sued uh, in an international forum, the legal advisor defense, so I argued cases at the International Court of Justice, Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal, NAFTA Tribunal, 
Uh, I appeared at the European Court of Human Rights, the African Court of Human and People's Rights. You know, I headed, co-headed our delegation to the International Criminal Court. And on all cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and the appellate court, you know, I was on uh, the counsel side of the brief with people in my office. So it was really a fantastically interesting job. Um, I mean, really, it's probably the most interesting job I'll ever have. So say a bit more about your vision in terms of um, one of the things you've talked about is um, building a, a global legal framework for the Obama administration around human rights, around humanitarian law, around counterterrorism, um, coming in that you wanted to sort of restore the role of international law to be taken seriously and something that the U.S. government would project. Um, can you talk a bit more about that vision? Yeah, if I were to summarize the challenge, it's um, 21st century problems and 20th century law. So uh, my first day of work, someone comes with a, uh, the frozen embryo of a large marsupial of Asian origin <laughs> is being held at customs in Baltimore. And the question is, is this frozen embryo entitled to foreign sovereign immunity or not? <laughs> and, you know, it occurred to me, uh, you know, the uh, framers of the Foreign Sovereign Union did not think about this issue. <laughs> and about a couple of days later, it's, um, if a guy sitting at Cyber Command in Fort Meade, Maryland, sends a computer signal that crosses borders and it disrupts a server in a foreign country, is that subject to the Geneva Conventions? And guess what? In 1949, they didn't think about that question. So there are two very broad choices. Uh, one is to say uh, these laws are quaint. Um, it's a black hole, or the Tina Turner approach, as we call it. You know, what, what's law got to do with it? You know, what's law but a sweet, old-fashioned notion? The other view, and by the way, I think that was predominantly the view of last administration, carving out various kinds of legal black holes because of a sense of emergency and urgency. Now, I understand that I think that was wrong. But the other approach, the alternative approach, I think is what I call translation, uh, which is Montesquieu's the spirit of the laws. So if the law were extended to this new and unanticipated situation, what would the rule be? And how can you be faithful to the spirit of the laws? And the fact of the matter is we live in a time where very few treaties are ratified, where Congress passes very few statutes. So fidelity to law is expressed by fidelity to the spirit of the laws. I mean, let me, let me just give you a very simple example that which showed how concrete this was on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lesbian couple decides to have a baby in a foreign country and the mother is an American, the one who's carrying the child. And they have the implanted embryo, uh, which is related to neither of them genetically. And the sperm comes from a foreign country, not the United States. The egg comes from another country, not the United States. The egg is fertilized and implanted into the US citizen mother, who carries it to term over nine months and delivers it in this foreign country. And the question is, is, is the child an American citizen? Now, it, under the law, it says the mother and the child must have a natural relationship. That's the words, natural relationship for citizenship to be passed from mother to child. And traditionally, we had defined that as a genetic relationship. Well, it turns out that they don't have a genetic relationship. So does that mean that the child is stateless? or that the mother has to re-adopt a child who was in her womb for nine months. So we looked at it, and I suggested that natural could include genetic or gestational. In other words, rather than saying there's a legal black hole, we would say that the spirit of the laws means natural can encompass a physical relationship over nine months. I thought it was a reasonable interpretation of the circumstance. Now, it was much discussed, but this is now the prevailing position. So I think this is the central challenge, is how to translate from existing laws 
to novel situations, even though the text doesn't tell you exactly what to do. And I think there are two other elements of the Obama administration's approach that were not well understood. One is, if you have a choice between going it alone or engaging with other entities, you engage. And then the third element, engage, translate, is leverage. The fact of the matter is that the US doesn't have the kind of resources to do everything by itself. My colleague at Yale, Paul Kennedy, talks about the decline and fall of the great powers and how when they try to dominate the world with hard power, uh, they're engaged in imperial overstretch. So what the Secretary of State articulated, Hillary Clinton, was a smart power approach, which meant you try to get traction on an issue by using your values, engaging around your values, building coalitions, and using different tools, and join with different partners to try to leverage to a solution. And I think the smart power approach is engage, translate, and leverage. Now, when you think about it, the last administration's approach, especially in the first term, was don't engage, go alone, don't translate, use black holes, don't leverage, be unilateral. And I think it was a stunning failure. And um, I think this approach, well, you know, frankly, it has had both a mixed record of implementation, is not only more sensible, but more likely to succeed in the long run. So what do you do, I mean, here's a question that many of us as lawyers face, or well face, when your role as a lawyer um, tells you one thing, but your, your, so your, your role as counselor tells you one thing, your role as conscience tells you another. What if those two things, or how do you make them fit together? So for example, with um, detention policy. Um, say you can interpret the law to allow for maximum authority to detain for a long period of time, terrorism suspects. Um, but what if that's damaging for the US's reputation as a matter of principle? Um, or in our self-interest, as a matter of our self-interest. What, how do you reconcile, in, in terms of the role of the legal advisor, what's your role in those circumstances? Well, the two questions on any policy option, one, is it lawful? And the second, is it wise? And, you know, if the client comes and tells you, I want to do X, the first question is what they propose to do lawful. If it's unlawful, say like torture, you say it's not legally available. But if it is available, legally, you say it's legally available. But then step two is you say, I wouldn't recommend it as a matter of policy because it's lawful but awful. <laughs> and we use that term a lot. So you don't want to confuse these things. If it's not legally available, you don't say it is. But if it is legally available and you don't recommend it as a matter of policy, um, you have to say that too. So for example, when I worked on Guantanamo, as you know, Catherine, since 1991, I visited there over a dozen times. When Guantanamo was first opened, the conditions were illegal. Uh, post-2003, when there was no habeas provided and the claim was in the black hole, it was illegal. Now, it is, to my judgment, um, an extremely, uh, a carefully regulated maximum security prison, which is an extremely bad piece of policy. But I don't think it's illegal. I think it's bad and should be closed. So if someone sues us about it, and I was working for the government, and there's a brief defending the lawfulness, I'll help it at that brief. But if I think it's a bad policy, uh, I'll say that internally. Or take another even clearer example, the death penalty. Uh, I despise the death penalty. I spent my whole life working against the death penalty. I don't think the death penalty straight up violates international law. I think it should, but it doesn't right now. Um, you know, various elements have been struck under the Constitution. But if I go before the UN Human Rights Council or another human rights body and I'm asked, is it illegal under international law? The answer is no. Um, do I favor it as a policy? The answer is also no. 
Well, so what about what about Guantanamo? You raised that, and you were a staunch um, advocate of closing Guantanamo, you know, during the 2008 presidential campaign, and also in the administration. Um, you know, you're, when I was your student, uh, we were working to shut down the detention of uh, Haitian refugees there in Guantanamo, right? 1991, I guess that was. And um, uh, when you were confirmed as legal advisor, I remember Hillary Clinton said. You know, Harold, I first met you, when I first met you, we, we talked about Guantanamo, and here we are, what was this, you know, t t some 20 odd years later, we're still talking about Guantanamo. I look forward to the day when we no longer have to talk about Guantanamo. What, where do things stand um, with Guantanamo, and um, how do we get there to shutting it down, and do you think it's gonna happen before Obama steps down from office? I think it will happen the day Obama steps down from office. Um, I think it's been a failure of political will. I think the big bang possibility was to close it quickly was lost in 2009. Congress got involved with the National Defense Authorization Amendments in a very unproductive way. I think the administration didn't carry through on its political promises uh, and frankly failed to great disappointment by many, including myself. But um, a year ago, May 2013, at the National Defense University, President Obama said, I would still want to close Guantanamo. He went back and got the issue. And there's now renewed energy behind it, but it's a um, trickle-down uh, approach. Um, he appointed a new special envoy, Cliff Sloan, who's a terrific lawyer in Washington. The numbers have dropped by about, I think, 15 since that point. Uh, there's a new blog that I write for called Just Security, and I wrote in October a blog called uh, Ending the War, or Ending the Forever War Progress Report. And I described how there are buckets of individuals on Guantanamo, and the challenge is how to reduce all of those buckets. So one bucket is the Yemeni bucket. I think that has to be addressed by block negotiations with the enemies. Another group is medical. I think that group, another group can be tried. Another group can be released on periodic review. Um, and I think actually they are addressing this on a systematic basis and they've renewed negotiations. Um, another part is keeping Congress from reenacting these restrictions, which never should have been enacted in the first place. And I do think that the president very much wants to close it on his watch. Um, just remember, you know, Jimmy Carter got the Iranian hostages out on his last day in office. And my guess is something similar to that will happen again. So um, is that good? No. Uh, but it's better than that the issue is lost. So um, what would be an alternative to Guantanamo? What would a wise, rational detention policy look like? or terrorism suspects? I think we've got it. Um, in the case of um, somebody like Warsami, um, they're apprehended, they're interrogated for purposes of law of war detention. Those detention or interrogations are forward-looking. The question at the first stage is, do you know any attack that might be coming so it's for preventive purposes? They are seen by the International Committee of the Red Cross. They are then given Miranda warnings. They seal an indictment against them before, and then they transfer them to the Southern District of New York, and then they're prosecuted. And that's now successfully happened with Abu Ghraib. It'll happen with Warsami. In other words, don't just pick up somebody without knowing what you think you're gonna do with them. The fact of the matter is that there aren't that many people who it makes a lot of sense for the U.S. to detain. I mean, the craziest thing was opening Guantanamo in. These people are in Afghanistan or other places that bring them to Cuba. That makes them our problem. It was an insane decision, and we've paid the price for it uh, for, for now 11 years. Well, should we be concerned that with the, um, you know, Bellinger talked the other night about the escalating use of, of drones, that um, I mean, is the Obama administration shifting to um, to target a killing in lieu of capturing and, and longer term detention? Well, first of all, the use of drones has declined 
So, John, I get that, right? Uh, secondly, you know, a lot of this is uh, expiation. Um, the fact of the matter is that, as you know from the press, there are a number of different theaters. And the ones in which I think it's being done extremely carefully, it has been done carefully, is Yemen and Somalia. The other piece of it is in connection with force protection with regard to Afghanistan and the joint areas. And that, I think, will be addressed by uh, removing or ending the war in Afghanistan. So um, I've written about this in the same blog in the speech I gave at Oxford a year ago, ending the forever war. I think that the drone standards need to be publicized. They need to be transparent. They need to be consulted with Congress. They need to be multilateralized, and most fundamentally, the U.S. government should release its numbers on what it believes to be civilian casualties. There is a wide and grotesque disparity between what is alleged and what the U.S. government believes. The U.S. government believes that the numbers are far, far lower than is alleged, say, in the Pakistani press. So that number ought to be put out there and discussed. And, um, um, the president's speech at the NDU was accompanied by a very high standard, a near certainty standard, and a statement that there would be a transition of authority from these issues to the Defense Department. So uh, has this been done perfectly? No. Is it moving in the right direction? Yes. So I think both detention and uh, targeting um, you know, got out of control for a while, and now I think at least they're moving in the right direction. The question is, will this administration have the political will to get to where they ought to be? Standards, transparency, consultation, and uh, clarity on civilian casualties. So with uh, the ongoing um, efforts to address terrorism, uh, as you mentioned, now that Obama's pulling out of Afghanistan, um, there's the authorization for use of military force in 2001. And should, is, is that the legal framework that the administration should continue to operate under, or do we need a new AUMF? Well, I think the president was correct in his May speech of last year. He should modify, narrow, and ultimately repeal the AUMF. I mean, he wants to get out of three wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Al-Qaeda and associated forces. And uh, once he has those three pieces under control, we don't need an AUMF. Um, so I, I wrote in speech, I hate to keep referring to this, how to, how to end the fervor war. You know, my view is the three pieces of this are disengaging from Afghanistan, disciplining drones, and closing Guantanamo. And there is progress on all three, slow, not as visible, as you'd like, but I think they're achievable. And I think when, um, uh, you know, the war in Afghanistan is a little bit like the flood water level being high. When it starts to drop, it'll be easier, I think, to address the question, how much do we need statutory authority to proceed against members of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces? If there are peace negotiations with the Taliban, they drop out of the equation. If you have a restricted definition of associated forces and don't just lump in the kitchen sink, then you're really down to core Al-Qaeda. And I think that group has been, as they say, decimated. And there can come a time when you say that they don't pose a coherent threat. And at that point, you can rely on uh, self-defense authorities, um, and uh, uh, constitutional authorities, not, not on a, a, a statute that's been around for 12 years and was actually designed to address a different situation. So our Article 2, the constitutional authorities as opposed to a new statute. You certainly don't need a new statute. We don't want to perpetuate this war. And this was the most important statement by the president in May of last year, which is perpetual war is distorting. This war has gone on longer than virtually any other. Um, the fact that the enemy is mutating or evolving doesn't mean that you keep extending it indefinitely. And we have a remarkable situation which your people are urging 
an extension of authority at a time. There has never been a situation in history that I know where Congress declared a war, extended a war that the president didn't want to continue. <laughs> so, um, and you know, by the way, if you haven't noticed, this country is sick of war. They're sick of the cost of war. They're sick of the distractions of war, et cetera. Now, what, what do you do about the fact that there are still terrorist attacks? Um, well, you know, the Boston Marathon bombers, I'm sorry, they're not members of Al-Qaeda. They're homegrown. You know, there's a difference between the people we originally declared war against, Osama bin Laden and his colleagues, and those who are imitators of them. And if you want to know the difference, don't you know the difference between the Beatles and the Beatles imitators? There are many imitators. Or the president put it well recently, where he said there are a lot of people wearing Laker jerseys, but they're not the new Los Angeles Lakers. So the actual group of people with whom war against against whom war has been declared is a finite number, and that number is declining. So let me pivot from the counterterrorism context. Ask you a couple other questions before we open it up. Um, you, um, oh, and as legal advisor, um, provided a legal rationale for the. Um, uh, what, what did you call it? the time-limited military intervention in Libya, not a war, but uh, the use of force in Libya on humanitarian intervention grounds. Um, what about Syria? Um, what's the solution there, and um, why can't the international community seem to be able to come to consensus to find some solution there? Well, I think the Libya case was a pretty clear example of something where um, I, I feel even more strongly today that I was correct than what had happened. You know, what was going to happen was uh, Gaddafi had made it clear that he was going to slaughter tens of thousands of innocent people in Benghazi. And what were being proposed were three options. Number one, do nothing and let them be slaughtered. I thought that was totally unacceptable. Number two, go to Congress and get approval for military force when people like John Boehner, um, John Kerry, Nancy Pelosi all said it was unnecessary, so they weren't going to vote it. So to call for that was essentially to call for no action, which would lead to them being slaughtered. And the third approach, which was suggested by John McCain, is call the War Powers Resolution unconstitutional, which frankly diverts the attention of everybody from the important thing, which is doing something. So what do you do? Engage, translate, and leverage. You get two Security Council resolutions, which we got. Second, you define a very limited piece of this action for military force. And the major need was to establish a no-fly zone so that Qaddafi couldn't bomb and kill his own innocent civilians. And the United States did that, and as soon as the uh, as soon as the uh, no-fly zone was established, it very much reduced and dropped its military role to essentially refueling uh, and surveillance operations. But I'm often asked, um, a significant fact to me is, well, guess what percentage of the ordnance dropped in Kosovo was dropped in Libya by US forces? Anybody, what percentage? Less than 1%. Now, my view was, and we toted up historical examples, there are at least seven examples in which more uh, military action was taken and that were called not hostilities. So, our solution was a fourth way, which was we don't challenge the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution, we acknowledge its role, and we say on the unique circumstances there where there's limited exposure of U.S. troops, where there's limited risk of casualties, where there's a limited military means being used, and a mission that's very carefully defined, the level of force is less than hostilities, and you can continue, which we did, and guess what? Tens of thousands of lives were saved. So, my view is, it was clearly correct, and a couple of many people were calling for humanitarian intervention and had no theory of the War Powers Resolution. 
that explain what you were supposed to do if you couldn't uh, succeed in the civilian protection mission in less than 60 days. A lot of the people in academia who were calling for military intervention were absent when the war powers issue was going on. And my view was the war powers resolution is a no more Vietnam's statute. It's not a let's have more Rwanda statute. We need a theory of war powers for the humanitarian intervention. And it was a success. <coughs> so what happened in Syria? Well, first of all, the Russians would not agree to any resolution. And so we then had a situation where there was an ambitious set of goals, um, getting rid of Assad, humanitarian protection, um, getting rid of uh, chemical weapons, stopping refugee outflows, and the only tools that were being proposed were soft power tools, diplomacy, uh, humanitarian assistance, and the like. And there was a gap. The soft power tools by themselves were not going to achieve those outcomes. And then the president announced that there was a red line for the use of chemical weapons, but he did it uh, too late. I mean, frankly, if he announced the red line, made it clear it was the world's red line, not his red line, and lined up congressional and allied support, it might have been able to make a difference. He then, last August, got clear evidence and I think it was unmistakable, the chemical weapons that had been used. And then suddenly, at a time when people are very distracted and going off on holiday and everything, said we need to do a military intervention. And everyone said, it looks like unilateral, going it alone, not engaging around our values and using our power. But the part they missed was this, the threat of force, reactivated diplomacy, they lowered the goal to getting rid of chemical weapons. It jump-started the diplomatic process. It brought the Russians to the table. Uh, the organization with the prohibition of chemical weapons was able to work, and now we have virtually eliminated chemical weapons from Syria. The next step, though, I think is much harder. And what I find remarkable is that, you know, friends of mine say there's an absolute prohibition against the use of force for humanitarian purposes in the absence of the Security Council resolution. And I just find this remarkable. The UN Charter is designed to protect human rights. Does anybody believe seriously that Vladimir Putin, who just invaded Crimea, cares about sovereignty? He's using a veto. The history of military efforts going from the Cuban Missile Crisis to things like India and Bangladesh Vietnam, Cambodia, show that force can be used consistently with the UN Charter. Um, you may not have prior permission, but it's not something that's clearly, to my mind, unlawful. And it is the threat of it that gives the extra dimension that allows soft power tools to work. So, frankly, what happened, I believe, was that Assad took the compromise which is the chemical weapons deal allowed him to stay in power and be part of an outcome, and he started to participate in the negotiation. The question is now, with all the problems around um, Putin and Crimea, uh, we're, we're not going to get a Security Council resolution, and Crimea has also sucked the air out of an effort to do this. What probably will be remembered to be sad to say is that Libya was the president's humanitarian intervention card and he played it. And right now, with two years to go, and the president at 40% popularity, uh, he doesn't get another crack at humanitarian intervention. So I also want to ask you about, um, just in terms of rule of law and, uh, and reestablishing uh, international law, um, about treaties, because of another thing John Bellinger said the other night, he pointed out, um, pointed to numbers, I think it was 163 treaties under the eight years under Bush, um, and he mentioned nine under Obama. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, John says that. <laughs> <laughs> Two things are different, right? Um, did the Senate under Bush 
by every congressional measure, including voting against the disabilities treaty when they, Bob Dole and McCain favored it. So what you can do when somebody's willing to do unanimous consent on certain treaties is different from what you can do when they will not cooperate on anything. So the idea that, you know, unfortunately it's a two-key system and the Senate has to go along. The second point, which just frankly is a function of the legal advisor's office, is before the Bush administration came in, it was noted that routine, uncontroversial treaties were not being ratified and more resources were given after an inspector general report and they tripled the number of attorneys and they gathered together many treaties that were uncontroversial and they got them through. And so that happened on John's watch and so John's telling you about it, but the fact of the matter is that uh, that was a, a bounce back from a period in which uh, a lack of resources made it very difficult to do that. So, you know, everybody is allowed to say what they did on their watch, but I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into it, to be honest. And in terms of closing some of the legal black holes you talked about, and one of the arguments that the Bush administration made was that, you know, certain treaties and legal obligations like the Geneva Conventions didn't apply to Guantanamo um, or had a narrow interpretation of human rights treaties. Um, is it time for the U.S. to drop its objections that treaties or human rights obligations don't apply overseas extraterritorially, like with the Torture Convention or the ICC, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights? Well, without commenting on any news stories, which I haven't commented on, the, the history of uh, human rights treaties since 1992-93, when we did the Haitian refugee case, has been an effort to set territorial limits and thereby to create black holes. And I think the message is it doesn't work. So the Supreme Court of the United States said that the Refugee Convention didn't apply extraterritorially, and the European Court of Human Rights has rejected that. Um, the US decided very late in the day that, late after it had ratified it and long after it had addressed it, that the ICCPR does apply extraterritorially, and the Human Rights Committee says differently, as do many, any serious uh, interpreter. The Torture Convention clearly applies extraterritorially on the face of the language. So I think these efforts, and by the way, you know, Guantanamo was supposed to be a law-free zone. Guess what? Habeas Corpus applies on Guantanamo, Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention applies. I think the law abhors a vacuum, and just trying to say it doesn't work. So what's another area? Uh, cyberspace, you know, China would like to say that cyberspace is a black hole. Um, I think already the emerging international law rejects that, and I gave a speech that was in the Harvard International Law Journal at Cyber Command that articulates that it's subject to uh, the rule of law. You know, the South China Sea, um, uh, it would be the goal of the Chinese to establish that that zone is essentially subject to what the Chinese call a nine-dash line. But the Philippines has sued them at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and so I think they'll get a legal ruling. So I think that you can run but you can't hide from international law, to paraphrase uh, Satchel Page, who I'm thinking of today on baseball season. <laughs> Let me ask one more question, then I think we want to open it up to the audience. So what do you see as the um, challenges today for international law? And if you uh, were to talk to Obama tomorrow, what would you tell him to prioritize for international law purposes? Well, the, I did tell him this, double down on smart power. So let, let's take an example. You know, um, there are a lot of people who want to use hard power against Iran to uh, eliminate their development of nuclear um, capability. And it turns out that we have a P5 plus one process that got to an interim Iranian nuclear deal, which was essentially sanctions driven. And now um, uh, I think it's gonna get to a final deal. Soft power worked. Uh, look at uh, Burma. Uh, soft power, smart sanctions approach worked. Uh, there are a bunch of people now who are saying, oh, you know, we should 
um, get tough with Putin, whatever that means. But NATO now won't cooperate. You know, Russia is, uh, their economy is being dramatically affected by these uh, smart sanctions. Various forms of ostracism and outcasting are being applied. And they take a little time to work. You know, just when you have cancer, people want to use surgery, but sometimes chemotherapy works better. Uh, it takes a lot longer, it's more painful. Um, my view is, over time, smart power works. You just have to have the patience to stick with it and go for it. And I, I think, you know, let's be honest, the, the president did not get reelected on foreign policy, and he won't be remembered for foreign policy. He'll be remembered for health care. And frankly, it's been a huge um, priority. What I do think he wants to be remembered for is ending wars. And I'd say, go for it. You know? <coughs> Here's a very important point, which I just want to emphasize to all of you. But let's suppose that seven days after 9-11, we had a president who had won the popular vote, Al Gore. <laughs> and he comes out and he says the following. Uh, in New York City, uh, 60 blocks from here, 3,000 people were killed for going to work. There are many countries that is a gross human rights violation. Unfortunately, we cannot do nothing. So let me tell you what I will not do, and let me tell you what I will do. I will not invade Iraq. I will not torture anybody. I will not open Guantanamo. I will not start military commissions. I will not do extraordinary renditions. I will not start bulk collection of data from people via the NSA. Here's what I will do. I will use smart power, and there I will reach out to Muslim communities. There is a hard core of Al-Qaeda adherents like Osama bin Laden who are unlikely to adjust. I'll try to capture and try those I can. And if the others are in a cave in Tora Bora, we've declared war on them. And consistent with constitutional law, consistent with international law, I will use every technological means at my disposal, including drones, to address that situation. And I hope it's over fast. Now, if you had done that, and if that's actually what we had done, I don't think there would be much objection. And he should have done that multilaterally in conjunction with our allies in consultation. So much energy was squandered doing all the wrong things. And then when the new administration came in, it started down the right road, got stymied, other things took priority, it sort of got off track. And I think then the president went back in last May and reannounced his commitment. Now, since then, his popularity has actually dropped. And he's had a whole bunch of other unexpected crises, like uh, Crimea, et cetera. So it's going to take a while to get there. But um, let me say this. I'm, I'm always struck by this. Um, suppose there's a fork in the road, right? You know, as uh, Yogi Berra says, if you see a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> so suppose the, the road taken is, should have been taken as the lower prong. And suppose the road, in fact, taken as the higher prong, which I think is wrong. When you're a professor, you can say, you know, the mistake was going down the wrong prong of the fork. I'm done. On to the next case. When you're in the government, you're heading down the wrong road. And the question is how to get it to go back to where it should be. And people looking at you are saying, see, you're still on the wrong road. Nothing has changed. In fact, a lot's changed. It's just you're trying to get back to where you should have been, and you don't have the luxury to go back. You know, I, I was opposed to the war in Iraq. I thought it was politically stupid. I thought it was illegal. But when I'm there, as legal advisor, my job is to do everything I can to make sure that we legally disengage from Iraq, even if it takes several years. I think we should have done more in Afghanistan much earlier. I think we should have done more against Al-Qaeda much earlier. And it's going to take a while for that disengagement to occur. But let's not confuse um, fixing things that were done mistakenly with 
uh, doing the exact same thing. And I think it's just too convenient uh, for people to say that kind of thing. Great, let's open it up to the audience. Okay, so start back here. Thank you. One of the last things you said, I think, uh, should be brought up. Um, they talk about mistakes and how they can be fixed. There was a mistake made that Bush did and Obama has continued, and that's classifying the 28 pages from the Senate investigative report dealing with 9-11, which points not to Osama bin Laden, as you referenced, but to the Saudi families and the funding conduits that took place. Obama promised to release those 28 pages and is yet to do so. Bob Graham, several congressional uh, representatives have been down there and said that after reading those pages, they had to rethink the entire 13 years of policy of the United States. So why aren't those things being released? As an international expert, why would we do that? The second thing is, on the situation in Ukraine, where I assume a colleague of yours, Newland, stated openly that the United States has put over billions and billions of dollars in the overthrowing of that government, and three days after that tape was released, her man, who she said we should get, Yats, somehow got the job. Now, you have neo-Nazis walking around the parliament and the legislator in the Ukraine, and how can you justify this other than a continuation of the policy of that there should be no more sovereignty, no more nation states that can function. And finally, do you have a favorite Nazi in the Ukraine or do you love them all the same? No. Um, number one, I say the transparency of the administration should use transparency more. Uh, both in and out of the government, I call for more transparency. I think it would help the case. I, I have no particular knowledge of what you're discussing there, but I, I favor transparency. I think it helps the government the legitimacy of its policy. On uh, Ukraine, um, Victoria Newland is, uh, I think, an extraordinary, diplomat, outstanding public servant. Sacrifice hugely for her country, hugely for her country, and. Um, she's honest and um, extremely able, and I'm glad she works for uh, as Assistant Secretary for European Affairs. So, because she has, on repeated occasions, uh, done, I think, brilliant work, I, I tend to trust what she, her estimations. I don't, I don't know if what you say is true, but I'll look into it. Um, right here. Um, I have a couple of questions. Please stop here. Is it a coincidence that since 9-11, we've lost virtually all of our constitutional rights? Um, and that relates to what Benjamin Franklin said, those who would sacrifice uh, a little freedom for security deserve neither. That's the first question. And the other question is, um, are you aware of US state-sponsored terrorism, aka false flags like the Gulf of Tonkin, um, does the U.S. condone that? Is it actively involved in it? And the final question is, it was great to hear you say that um, you're against the death penalty. But when 95% of drone strikes kill innocent civilians in third world countries, how do you justify the legal, your legal justification for drone strikes? Well, number one, if we lost most of our constitutional rights since 9-11, no, I do not believe so. I think it's, it's a good idea to make measured statements because then people don't think you're making overstatements. Number two, um, I forget what number two was. Uh, Are you aware of U.S.? No, I'm not aware of U.S. state-sponsored terrorism. On number three, um, as I stated in this speech, a very carefully worded and written and read his speech in 2010, drones are being used in the course of armed conflict, and that's quite different from the use of the death penalty. Um, in fact, 
targeting and warfare is done in an extremely different way than judicial process that leads to an execution under domestic criminal law. So I think it needs to be understood in those terms. But 95% of the victims of the drugs. I do not think you have any proof of that. And um, if you can give me conclusive proof of that, uh, that would be very interesting. But I, I think repeating things that are said on the internet is not the same thing as proving that there are 95% civilian casualties. Let's come over to the side of the room. Uh, Martin Valerity. Welcome back, Harold. Um, I'm Martin. My question is, um, how great a blow has been dealt to the post-World War II international law framework by the invasion of Crimea? And you know, as follow-ups to that, is the current um, chemotherapy, as you characterize it, going to be enough to undo the damage? And if not, what else should both the US and the West do? I don't think it's irreversible, but I think um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I thought it was significant that the president made his trip um, as a way of building soft power in coalitions as a way to respond. And essentially to work on putting a framework in place that's going to keep squeezing. And you know, the basic strategy is that when the Soviet Union was isolated, there were fewer pressure points. Since then, Russia has become re-engaged in a world economy, you know, there are oligarchs. I mean, they own major basketball teams and other things. <laughs> uh, I think the theory is that very, very wealthy Russians don't want to be sanctioned. And the smart sanctions approach has worked in other areas. So um, was it a very bad moment? Yeah. So I thought Mike McFall, our ambassador to Russia, who just stepped down and went back to Stanford, put it very well in the New York Times. Uh, op ed where he described Putin's return after Medvedev stepped down as a very bad moment because it became clear that Putin was much more interested in suppressing dissent, um, you know, determined to appeal to the right wing of his country. Um, he did so. He's much less interested in uh, cooperating on a multilateral basis. So it may be that what we thought was a period of glasnost has cooled, and it's going to make everything a lot harder. Um, <laughs> that the period after the post-Cold War, now the post-Cold War is going to be a lot harder. So I think it's going to be a challenge, and China represents its own challenge. Uh, and it certainly doesn't help that we have a political system <laughs> that inspires confidence in no one, or that cannot do the most basic elements of governance. You know, I have great difficulty confirming officials for uncontroversial posts. You know, some people think it makes more sense to shut down the government. Now, I'll tell you a story about that because it's just so painful and ridiculous, which is that during Libya, um, my wife calls me and says, a friend of ours is trying to reach us from Connecticut, our New Haven. And I call this woman with whom my daughter went to school, and she says, our other daughter has been captured in Libya. She's a journalist. And we don't know where she is. And she was in tears. And over the course of the next 80 days, every single night I called her and said, we we're trying to find her. And finally, we got a lead. And we had a team of about 15 people in the State Department who were working day and night on her case and the related case. And then they tried to shut down the government. And we had a meeting on a Friday where I had to inform these State Department employees, if the government shuts down and you're using your BlackBerry and your cell phone to try to find this woman, you're risking violating criminal laws. And they said, go ahead and let them prosecute us. <laughs> they said, we're doing our work here. Do you think any of these members of Congress, if their kid was captured, 
would accept uh, the notion that we shouldn't keep working to find them. We're not playing here. We have human lives at stake, and we're not going to give up for political posturing. Anyway, she was found and released, and we had a big party in her honor. But my view is that there's something real going on, and then there's a lot of political posturing around it. And you know, let's let's focus on the real things. Right here, yes. Hello. Okay. My question is, um, I read the New York Times story and the memos that you had written during the, your time in the administration regarding the extraterritorial application of the ICCPR and U.S. obligations under that. I'm wondering if they were written at a time when the right to privacy was not such a big issue and uh, NSA surveillance outside the U.S. borders was not such a big issue. So I'm wondering uh, how you would apply the same analysis to the situation today and the right to privacy how, as it applies outside of U.S. borders and obligations under the treaty. And also specifically, uh, your analysis regarding um, the um, positive and neg negative obligations under the treaty regards to that. Uh, so, uh, number one, I did not give those memos to Charlie Savage. Uh, number two, I didn't comment on the story of the New York Times, so I'm not going to now. Number three, they are my memos. Number four, the analysis in those memos is correct. And if you <laughs> look at them, it will answer your question. Um, that's all I can say. Right here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mike Diedrich. Um, I spent some time in Iraq and Afghanistan, both of those places. I came back more cynical and uh, liberal than when I went. Um, first off, my overall question deals with you may be giving advice to the law students in the audience. Second, my second thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate you being here and everything you've said. I applaud your, your career. And my uh, proposal, I guess, would be you seem to be the type of guy that would be like a great founding father. If we were back 200 years ago, the intelligence, the rationale. But the thing that I wonder about is how do we get, we as lawyers and future lawyers, get society and the body politic to believe in the rationality as opposed to ignoring it. And it just seems to me that part of that needs to be to incorporate into legal thinking and policy making a scientific understanding, maybe go back to your physics, but the scientific understanding of human nature. Things like uh, evolutionary psychology, E.O. You know, Wilson biology, figuring out where we are being altruistic, where we are being selfish, but how we can convince our adversaries, how we can convince the other side, because I, to some degree I think you're preaching to the choir when you talk to other lawyers, um, but how do we convince the people that don't want to listen that we have things that are logical and make sense for the betterment of the society? Because I don't realize it's a little bit of a broad question, but I'm just curious as to how you might um, react to that in bringing in science into Law and public policy. So I've been a lawyer for 34 years. Uh, I've been a professor for 30 years, 31 years. And I've been in the government for 10 years of those 31 years. Um, and my view is to the students um, do both practice and uh, think about the bigger issues. My father liked to say, Theory without practice is as lifeless as practice without theory is thoughtless. You gotta do them both. And when you go to the government, you learn it's a long way from a good idea to getting it done. There's a great story told about Mickey Mantle. Uh, he um, you know, was frequently injured and um, he was on one particular day not 
going to play, so he went out the night before and got tremendously drunk and was hung over. And then the next day, he's sitting out the game, and then suddenly in the ninth inning, they call him up, and he staggers to the plate, swings wildly the first time and misses, swings wildly the second time, and the third time he hits a tremendous home run, and he runs around the bases, and the crowd is cheering. And he looks out at the crowd, and he says to his uh, teammates, those people don't know how hard that really was. <laughs> well, you know, it is really hard to get something done in the government. You could know exactly what should be done, and then you have to get a thousand people to go along. And so you've got to be involved in the fight. Um, as Catherine knows, uh, on my last birthday, my wife said to me, you know, you have worked on closing Guantanamo in some form or another for 18 of your last 21 birthdays. So that can make you feel like you're not quite reaching your goal. <laughs> On the other hand, um, if you're not going to do it, who's going to do it? Uh, I'll tell the students the most important thing. Um, my dad, uh, who was my hero, was in the Korean government for about a year. And his government was overthrown by a military coup. And um, the Korean embassy gathered in Washington. He was the senior official. And they took an oath that they would never serve a military dictatorship. And within two years, every single person had broken that vow, except for my father. And he was the one who didn't serve in the government again. And once I said to him, do you regret that? And he said, I love being in the government. It was the most exciting time of my life. But guess what? Uh, there are people in the government who hold certain jobs, and you remember absolutely nothing about them. He said, there's always someone who can get these jobs if they're willing to do what people want and if they stand for nothing. And then there are other people who you don't even remember whether they have these jobs because they had certain values and principles that they fought for. And he said, try to be the kind of person who lives by certain principles. And forget about whether you get jobs or not. I see too many students who want to go to the government because they want to be part of the show. And I say, it's not enough. You've got to go there because you want to do something. And then when you're there, have the guts to fight for it. Time and again, I saw people who told me they wanted to do things, and they check it out. And they talked a good game, and they didn't get it done. And I say to them, that's not good enough. You know, if you're going to go, and you're, if you're not giving it your all, um, somebody else should be there. That's not going to say you're always going to succeed, but you know, Mickey Mantle failed seven times out of ten, and he's in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so, close enough. Well, gosh, that, uh, I feel like that's such a good note to end on, because, uh, you know, you should be in the Hall of Fame of <laughs> this, uh, this field. Um, we have a reception and plenty of time for people to come up to chat with Professor Coe. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank Professor Coe. I've known Catherine for, what, 23 years? But who's counting? Who's counting? She was a young girl when I met her. Um, and it's exciting. And also, um, thank you to the Fordham International Law Journal, and particularly to Beth Gavin for making this possible. It's been a great pleasure. And I should finally say that my father-in-law uh, went to Fordham Law School. And he loved Fordham Law School. He particularly loved John Furyk who moved his admission to the Supreme Court bar. And so this is a great day because of John Ferrick, and I wish him well as, uh, as well. Great, thanks.